Okay, so I think I think we are ready to start. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this webinar, which is the fourth of a series of 23 webinars being organized by GRFDT, MFA, CCRM, and the Civil Society Action Committee. Uh, this webinar is focusing about, on objective four of the Global Compact, which is really about legal identity and documentation. Um, and again, it is one of those 23 uh, objectives of the Global Compact that we will be focusing on in this series of webinars. So welcome, and we are very happy that you are able to join us. Uh, we will be going on for, for two hours starting from now. Uh, our topic today, as I mentioned, is really about documentation. And this is one of those areas that is all encompassing when we talk about migration. It is one of those bigger questions and bigger areas that we always come back to in each and every uh, discussion. It's about migrants with documents. It's about migrants without documents. Um, it's about you know those migrants whose documents are being withheld at countries of destination. It's about those migrants who have lost their documents for one reason or another and cannot um, you know uh, issue replacement documents it's about people who who are born in, in places that you know does not provide them with documents as well and it's about many many other situations uh, that we see across the, the migration corridor uh, the discussion about documentation is one that is very very important and we will try to break this down with our panelists today, specifically because it has a very big impact on the choices that migrants have in, in countries of destination. It also has a big impact on the kinds of services they are able to access, and it has a very big impact in their ability to enjoy their human rights. Um, in a way, um, migrants' lives and the entirety of the migration journey depends in one way or another on documentation whether in a positive sense or in a negative sense. So today we will try to answer a number of questions and our panelists will help us try to answer a number of questions, including is documentation as important as it is? Why do we need documentation? How can we move to, towards you know, better documentation as well about documentations that puts migrants at the center of it, not the migration management at the center of it? Um, so today's webinar is, is something that we will, you know, we'll try to address all these questions and many more questions as they arise. But to help us do that, uh, we have, um, you know, we have a number of speakers who will help us address these questions. And these speakers are, are very well known. They are also good friends and colleagues. So I'm very happy to introduce them. Um, our first speaker will be uh, Pia Oberoi, who is the Senior Advisor on Migration and Human Rights for the, office, uh, for the United Nations Human Rights Office, OHCHR. Pia is currently based for, in Bangkok, but many of us know Pia from before when she was also based in Geneva um, as the head of the migration team uh, in OHCHR Geneva. Uh, before joining OHCHR, Pia also worked for Amnesty International. Uh, thank you, Pia. We're very happy that you are with us uh, today. Um, our second speaker is Lala Arabian. Um, in addition to being my boss, Lala is the executive manager of Insan Association. Lala has started working on human rights issues starting in, in the year 2000 and has um, worked for a number of organizations in Lebanon. Um, she was also uh, the head of, of, you know, the coordinator of campaigns at Amnesty International. So welcome to you, Lala. We're very happy that you are here with us today. Um, our third speaker is Michel Lavoie. Michel Lavoie is the director of PICOM, which is the platform for international cooperation on undocumented migrants. Uh, she leads the, the organization's work in advocating and monitoring and raising awareness on the issue of undocumented migrants, which is really at the heart of what we are touching on today. Um, in addition, Michel serves on a number of uh, global and EU level uh, boards, including the Civil Society Action Committee for the Global Forum on Migration and Development, the Global Coalition on Migration, uh, the Women and Global Migration Working Group, uh, to name just a few. Uh, welcome, Michel. We are very happy that you are with us today. Um, our fourth speaker is Gopal 
Siwakodi, Gopal is actually the chair and the steering committee member of APRIN, uh, which is the Asia Pacific Refugee Rights Network. Uh, APRIN is a coalition of more than 450 organizations and individuals in Asia um, who is dedicating to, to protecting and safeguarding the rights of refugees in the region. He was also heavily involved in the development of the GCM and the GCR, so he brings those two views um, for us today and also serves as the advisor of, for the platform on disaster displacement and statelessness network in Asia Pacific. Thank you, Gopal, for being with us today and welcome to this webinar. Um, and you. our last and our last speaker is actually Tendai Bloom. Tendai is a lecturer in politics and international studies at the University of Birmingham in the UK. Uh, Tendai has worked very closely on, on the GCM and uh, focused heavily on, on questions of legal identity. Uh, she published a blog post on the Global Compact on Migration. Uh, which provided a starting point for considerations related to statelessness and migration uh, governments. Welcome, Tendai. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, this, is, this is in regards to who our panelists will be today. Uh, with regards to how we will proceed in, in today's webinar, we do have a few rules. Uh, the webinar will go on for a duration of two hours, so we'll try to, to stay within the boundaries of time. Uh, we will start with the first round with each of our speakers, and we will go for around eight minutes um, in the first round of questions. If time allows, we will try to come back with a follow-up question for our speakers. Um, after that, we will, we will take a few comments from the floor, and I will, I will call on a few of you, and I'll say in a, in a few minutes who those will be, so that you can also prepare yourself. So we'll have a round from the floor followed by uh, concluding thoughts and remarks by our speakers. Uh, we are also trying something new uh, today. We will try to foster as much interaction as possible. And one way to do this is by testing um, three, uh, a poll question. We will have three poll questions during this webinar. One we will have in a, right now in a few seconds. The other one we will have after our panelists have finished. And the last one we will have after the, the, the interaction from the floor. And the questions will try to, to see how all of you are on, on the subject of, of documentation. What do you think are kind of the essential issues? Um, and then to, to, to capture the audience, you know, and how we are also reflecting on this. So before we start, let us, let us try um, and, and start with this poll. Uh, Rakesh, if we can display the question. For our, for our audience to vote on. Ah, we seem to be having an issue with the poll. Okay, um, this, is, this is an experiment. So, so we will try to, to fix that and come back to the poll at a later time. Uh, but anyways, let us dig right into the, the heart of the, the subject actually. And maybe we can, we can start with UPA and hopefully we'll be able to come back to the poll at, at some point in time. But Pia, Objective four is, is really about um, the whole question of ensuring documentation. And um, the text of the Global Compact talks about, you know, ensuring that migrants are issued with adequate, adequate documentation as a means to empower them to effectively exercise their human rights. Um, maybe can, can you help us understand why are documents essential to, to the enjoyment of human rights? And also, can we reflect on this linkages between documentation and the enjoyment of, of human rights? And if we make such linkages, are we inevitably uh, leaving behind a few who, for one reason or another, will not have access to documentation? So Pia, can we start with you um, to reflect on some of these questions? Sure, thanks. Uh... We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, sorry, I've been frozen here. Um, no, thank you very much um, for inviting me and, and for really for some very interesting questions that you've um, just posed. Um, I'm going to just start by going quickly through some of the, um, I think it, it's useful to, to think about what Law what says about uh, documentation, legal identity, uh, proof of nationality. And it really distinguishes between 
the right to nationality and documents that constitute proof of legal identity. So for instance, in relation to the right to nationality, we have Article 24 of the ICCPR um, that talks about children being able to be registered after birth. The right to birth registration is also um, in the Convention on the Rights of the Child as well as the Migrant Workers Convention. So we have um, a body of standards that relate to the right to nationality. We also have then um, standards relating to the right to identity. So Article 6 of the UDHR and Article 16 of um, the Civil and Political Rights Covenant um, make clear that everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. And I think that's an important one because it, it um, recognizes that everywhere, everybody has an identity. Um, and building on this, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in its 60, target 16.9 calls on all states to provide legal identity for all, including universal birth registration. So there is a body of standards there that, that um, you know, we're kind of building on. Um, and, and the other key principle I think that's important to, to rem remember in when we're thinking about uh, the right to identity in human rights law is the principle of non-discrimination. So individuals should not be discriminated against in exercising their human rights, including access to basic services deriving from those rights solely on the basis of a lack of identity documents. So if, if somebody has identity documents and somebody doesn't, um, there, there shouldn't be um, a discrimination in relation to which one of them gets to access um, the, their, so the services and the rights. Just maybe a, a one minute on the right to nationality, and then I want to spend a little bit more on the right to identity, because I know that some of your speakers will be speaking about statelessness as well. But just to say that, uh, you know, one of the key measures um, to protect rights is the conferral of nationality on a child um, as early as possible after the birth, um, particularly if the child would, would otherwise be stateless. So in some countries, for instance, in our region, in the Asia Pacific region, statelessness has persisted through generations. I mean, you have people that are living in a territory um, where they are um, subject to, to um, a, a lack of access to nationality. Um, and, and so really one of the critical safeguards is to ensure that nationality laws allow children born in the territory of a state to acquire the nationality of that state if they would otherwise not be entitled um, to, to uh, a nationality, if otherwise they would be stateless. And I think that there's gendered issues here around discrimination against you know, the ability for women to transfer their nationality uh, to their children or even their spouses. So moving on to the right to identity, and, and I think what's the important point to mention here, we talk about the right to have rights. In the end, human rights are inherent to all human beings. So the absence of documentation, the absence of being able to prove that they're one status or the other, doesn't really matter in the sense that they are still human beings and they should not impede this, the lack of documentation should not impede the recognition of their human rights and also then you know, the services that flow from them. So following on from that, states should have some responsibility to provide identity documents. And that should cover both regular and irregular migrants. Um, there is a particular provision in this um, objective four that we're looking at on consular protection. Um, and there I note, for instance, that in fact, there's been in the context of COVID, you know, quite uh, uh, problems with this, this um, protection um, and, and uh, complaints about lack of consular support to stranded migrants, for instance, stranded South Asian migrants um, in the Gulf countries. And it really points then to a power imbalance, you know, who, who is there to protect the voiceless when you're in this situation of, of um, uh, inequality. So the issue of undocumented or irregular migrants is a key feature of this objective. And obviously, as, as we all know on this call, um, there is a very, very large, even though if it's uncounted, so we don't, you know, kind of, you know, have the kind of impressive figures to say it's this million or that million, very large uncounted number of migrants who are without regular status. And often, most often, it's not because they've sneaked in, most often because they've entered regularly and lost the status. Um, and uh, the consequences for having lost the status um, are, are, are very stark and, and other speakers on your panel will speak to that. Um, you know, the, the lacking access to, to essential services, unable to access health education, um, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and obviously when documentation is itself confiscated, confiscated or kept either by border authorities or employers, the migrant is him or herself made more vulnerable um, including through not being able to have equal access um, to justice. 
this vulnerability really is rooted in the inability of the migrant to call upon the basic protective functions of the state in which they reside for fear of deportation. And so that's where the, 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 the issue really comes to, um, that it's, it's not so much the do documentation isn't the thing that gives you rights, but it is the thing that you know, allows you to, to, to stand up before the state and say, I, I need some protection, this is who I am. So while undocumented migrants are not technically status, they do exist in the legal limbo that somehow recalls statelessness. And the, within, so their state of residence does not recognize their existence because they're undocumented. And they are for all intents and purposes beyond the reach of their state of nationality. And, you know, thinking about the lack of consular protection, et cetera. I just wanted to, to finish really with thinking about the contested nature of documentation. And I think you asked a question there in the beginning, Bulat, that kind of goes to this. Countries of destination demand identity documents, for instance, to be provided by migrants um, in order to facilitate their return uh, to uh, origin countries. So migrants will out of necessity often destroy their papers in order to avoid what they know are unsustainable returns, what they know are not returns that, are, um, uh, uh, that, that will protect their rights, for instance. So in fact, invisibility, the lack of documents can be more rewarding for the migrant than an identity that is criminalized and traced forever. If we're thinking, for instance, about um, in the context of counterterrorism, no fly lists where people end up on these lists and are never able to, to be removed from them or entry bans um, after administrative infractions, including entering a country um, irregularly. So that's one thing where I would, you know, kind of uh, contextualize and maybe problematize the, the, this, this need to have documents. Also in the absence of firewalls, and I'm sure Michelle and others will talk about the importance of firewalls, but undocumented migrants who use identity documents to access services in the absence of these firewalls could find themselves subject to immigration enforcement. So many will choose not to access services, even if they are so entitled to avoid such penalties. So in these, these uh, circumstances, you know, I mean, how does um, identity, how do identity documents actually help? Um, they, they, they might actually lead you into further peril. And more broadly, the provision of documents reflects the imbalances of power and structural inequalities that underlie migration governance more broadly. So migrants who are poor, uh, and so who can't afford the very high costs associated with documents, um, uh, including the payment of bribes, which is, which is often the, um, the, the, the context in which documentation is provided to migrants, um, will be unable to, to access uh, documents. Those who lack access to information about how to go about getting documents in a language or a format that they understand. So some migrant women may be in this, it's a lack of um, educational literacy, migrants with disabilities because they can't understand the format. Or those who are subject generally to discrimination, certain ethnic groups, for instance, among migrant groups, they will face far greater struggles in accessing documentation. And, and this often applies whether they are in regular or undocumented situations, but is, is often more stark when they're undocumented. So really, as a closing thought, from a human rights perspective, in giving um, effect to objective four, the state and stakeholders who are involved um, in, in implementation of the GCM should really examine the intent behind the various actions um, described in the commitment. And that is to fulfill the right of all individuals to a legal identity. Um, um, and therefore how best to ensure this right and the entitlements that flow from it. Because we can easily go in the conversation about documents down um, a, a path of using, as you were saying, we are using documents um, and documentation as a way to ensure and build up migration management, as opposed to uh, the rights and protections um, of migrants. And I think that, you know, as you'll probably hear about later in the panel, are there any other spaces in which identity can be granted? So these kind of national documentation um, that could, could be problematized by, for instance, uh, the concept of urban citizenship, where you have cities that provide documentation to, to migrants. And I think that there is definitely work to be done um, in, in evolving the jurisprudence at the national, the regional, the international level to tease out how to resolve the conflict between the undocumented status of people and what that means in terms of their access to rights and the principle of universalism in international human rights law where technically people have these rights for, by dint of being um, humans, but there are certain gaps, I think, in, in human rights law in terms of providing that protection. And maybe thinking about building the capacity of judges and lawyers to, to protect the right to identity, and also how human rights should apply 
regardless of whether the migrant can provide this proof or identity um, and, and how to ensure that happens. And finally, I would leave you with, with um, you know, maybe a challenge to um, the colleagues listening on this call to provide us with good practices as a, as a way to understand how these good practices can be developed and amplified from the bottom up to understand what it is that migrants are facing and how, um, what, what they need in terms of their right to identity. Um, we know what the state wants and, and what the state needs, but what do migrants really need in terms of um, being able to access their rights? I will stop here, Rula, because I've been just watching a frozen screen the whole time I've been speaking. So I really hope that you guys are still there. Thank you, Pia. Yes, we could hear you. We actually had an issue with the camera. We couldn't okay. see you at some point, but hopefully that um, that is resolved when we when we go back to you. But um, no, thank you very much. I think um, a crucial point emerging from what you're saying is one does not have to 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 kind of cancel the other. Uh, you know. People are, you know, have, have, you know, inalienable rights regardless of status, uh, regardless of documentation, but that should not, so, should not also preclude us of also maybe um, improving the documentation system. But it's also a question of, um, I guess it's also a question of um, how much documentation is needed. And, and I think some of us who are also working on, on, on the issue on the ground it seems that at some point, what, what used to be sufficient documentation maybe 20 years ago, now has, has been replaced by a multitude of, of more documentation. And it's not just um, you know, documentation of um, you know, a nationality or documentation of birth, but it's kind of these multitudes of systems. And, and it's very interesting, Pia, that, you've, that you mentioned um, this, this angle of, of migrants who forego documentation for their own protection. And, you know, um, my country, Lebanon, I, you know, for, during the civil war, people would just leave and tear their passport. And that back then, like 30 years ago, that was possible because people could not identify you. But now I, I think it is more challenging for people to get rid of their passport and claim status in a country because of the evolution in technology and tracing and all these kinds of technologies. But thank you very much. A lot to think about uh, from what you said, Pia. We'll come back to you uh, with, a few, with a few more questions, hopefully. But let me go back to, let me go to, to Lala actually, and maybe from something that, that Pia has talked about. I know Pia has mentioned the issue of, of children in particular and the documentation of children um, in particular. And I was wondering, Lala, if you can reflect on, um, you know, the, the situation of, of documentation and children in the context in my, of migration, and in particular on how much documentation do we need for children to be on par with, you know, non-migrant children as well, and what are the, some of the challenges there? Lala, we're not able to hear you. Okay. Hi. I wasn't able to unmute myself, so. <laughs> yes, we can hear you now. So, okay. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit uh, particularly about the Lebanon. It was said of migrants, when they enter Lebanon, they come uh, documented, but then at some point they lose, uh, some of them lose their documentation for various reasons. It might be that uh, they will be confiscated. Lala, we, we're having trouble hearing you. Can I suggest um, to try to turn off the camera? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Is it okay? Let's try. Hello? Lala. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. So I was now when my workers come come with the documents. So they are documented. Uh, they will their uh, documentation. Uh, 
uh, for various reasons. It might be that uh, they, were, they are comfortable the job, uh, the documents will stay. Uh, uh, it is really, I mean, um, the at that point, they won't have the Lala, we are losing you again. Um, may I may I, suge may I suggest we, we go back to you? I'll just skip to Michelle and then I'll come back to you. Maybe the connection issue will be resolved. I will try to change my connection. Yes, great. Thanks. Okay. 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 Um, okay. So so since we've been having some technical issues, let's go let's go to you, Michelle. Uh, Michelle, I know you you worked a lot on. On, on the rights of undocumented migrants. And, um, and I think it's important to also shed light on, on what the absence of documentation does to migrants. And I think at the beginning of the webinar, we started by asking, is documentation important? And I, wanna, I want to see uh, what's your take on this? Is documentation important? And, and the lack of documentation, what kind of impact uh, does it have on, on migrants? Thanks a lot, Rula. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hopefully seeing as well. Um, so thanks very much uh, for organizing this. Uh, it's very impressive actually to be going through the all the, the 23 objectives of the Global Compact on Migration with a webinar. Um, so I wanted to shed some light on um, the experiences of our network in looking at two parts of ob objective four, which are basically the last two parts, the F and the G section, which basically look at uh, kind of an answer also to your question, Rulo, what happens when you don't have documentation? And as Pia already said, you want to access services or you want to access justice. And just give some examples from uh, the region of Europe where PICOM is based. Um, I wanted to start off with talking a little bit about um, what we've seen as developments during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, because they've actually, I think, been interesting in terms of accessing services. So we've seen, um, a, a couple of different types of responses when you when you consider uh, both the national level, the city level, and the regional level. First, on the national level, um, we've seen uh, two countries in the past six months that have granted some form of regularization so that people who were undocumented could access services safely or if it wasn't a regularization, it was a type of firewall. And so these two examples uh, were Portugal. I think many of you most likely followed the, the example of Portugal, um, where it was um, a country that developed a temporary regularization for people who had applied um, for uh, a residence permit early in the year. Um, and the benefit of the regularization procedure was that those people who had applied and who were granted this measure in lockdown could get access to social protection um, easily. So without, even though they were undocumented, even though their application was pending, um, they had this temporary regularization. So it was estimated um, that around 20,000 to 30,000 people would have been reached by this. However, 80,000 to 100,000 were most likely also excluded. Um, and that was because this was a regularization that concerned people who had already applied. So, and those people who didn't apply I never had the chance to apply because they didn't have all the required proof that they were workers or, or other things that were needed at the time. So the other national level example that we found was Ireland. Um, Ireland is interesting because it's precisely what we're looking at in this video. So it was um, a firewall measure. So Ireland um, decided that during the pandemic, during the lockdown, um, undocumented migrants would have full access to social welfare and health care. And authorities confirmed that there would be no data sharing between service providers and immigration uh, officers. Um, undocumented workers who lost their job because of the COVID um, effects on the economy could also apply for the pandemic unemployment payment, um, which was a payment of 350 euros per week for a period of 12 weeks. That's extremely interesting because we have not found any other examples in Europe 
of a national level government uh, enabling undocumented workers to be eligible for unemployment due to the pandemic. So most of the European countries were offering some support to unemployed workers, but that did not include undocumented, whereas in Ireland it did. And then another example um, is on the national level, access to food and nutrition schemes and shelters during the pandemic. So we saw that in seven countries, Belgium, Finland, France, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Spain, and Switzerland, undocumented migrants could get access to food and nutrition schemes. And in um, eight countries, they could get access to emergency shelter. Belgium, the Czech Republic, Finland, Malta, the Netherlands, Norway, Switzerland, and the UK. So this is kind of what we've seen as examples on the national level. If we look at the other levels of government, this is also where it's um, interesting. Um, the city level in Italy, um, the central government had made available 400 million euros via the Civil Protection Department for cities across Italy to issue supermarket vouchers to local residents. But then each city or municipality had to decide the criteria to access it. And in Rome, a, ju a judicial decision, and this is also in relevance uh, to what Pia had just ended with about um, working with judges and lawyers on undocumented and, and their human rights and making sure that the jurisprudence also reflects this. So thanks to a judicial decision, um, the purpose of that benefit that the national level government had made, um, the, the judge decided that um, it would be illegitimate for um, the city to set conditions such as making sure that they had a registered address, which would limit the number of beneficiaries. And that wasn't requested by law. So thanks to this judicial decision, um, undocumented migrants in the city of Rome could be eligible to receive those supermarket vouchers. We found a couple other examples of the city level in the Netherlands. Um, I had already mentioned the national level about night shelters, but also the city of Amsterdam provided space for homeless people um, until the 1st of August, including undocumented. The Hague also had some temporary shelters until early July. Um, and also the city of Amsterdam was giving some financial support to NGOs to help um, strengthen their own support to undocumented. And so also just briefly, um, we also saw some regional level responses. So regional here, we mean sub level of government. Um, so in Spain, they have various autonomous regions. Um, and in early April, the government of the region of the Balearic Islands passed an expansion of its guaranteed social income to cover all adults who were experiencing a social emergency due to COVID. That actually was also then granted to undocumented. Uh, they were, the regional government allowed at six NGOs to receive direct subsidies so that they could pay undocumented migrants that support who didn't have a bank account. Um, in Switzerland, the city of Geneva also passed a law to offer financial co compensation for up to 80% of the income lost during the period from March until May. Um, this would also extend to undocumented. And the city of, um, and the canton of Zurich were also like the other examples, giving funds to NGOs to help undocumented meet their basic needs. So all of these are really interesting examples because they're the most recent and they also, um, we think are somewhat exceptional um, because the across this region, um, undocumented were essential workers like in many other regions and yet we're not guaranteed any of and, and the majority were not guaranteed the support um, that everyone else um, needed during COVID times. Um, so I, I wanted to finish then with looking at the other two areas um, and how we see them. So access to healthcare and access to justice. Um, we see in terms of access to healthcare that undocumented in general in this region in Europe have very limited entitlements to healthcare under national law. Um, and as Pia had already said, even if they might have uh, the, the entitlements, they just by going to benefit from it, they would risk being reported if there's no firewall. Um, the same is true for access to justice. Um, in this region and in many other regions as well, 
law enforcement officials uh, see undocumented victims as offenders, so not as victims. So basically, it's almost impossible to try to report a crime if you're undocumented because the police will report you to the immigration authorities. Um, if That means if you're a woman who's experienced gender-based violence, there have been many, many cases of women who are undocumented reporting the crime of their undocumented partner. And there has been cases also of the two being put in a police cell and being deported together, the woman who was the victim and her aggressor. So we have cases like that that I'm sure you also see in your regions. But access to justice is even much more problematic than access to healthcare because of this whole incidence about reporting personal identities of, of the from the police to the immigration authorities. What we find is interesting is um, in this area, this is where the EU itself has legislation. There's the Victims of Crime Directive from many years ago, from a number of years ago, but it's not that old. Um, and what's interesting is the Victims of Crime Directive in the first article says that the scope of the whole directive is applicable to all victims of crime, regardless of resident status. So that was a huge opening of a door to mean that undocumented migrants could potentially benefit from the protections in this legislation. And in June of this year, uh, the European Commission launched its first strategy on victims' rights. So bearing in mind the legislation, how would the EU now go about developing a whole strategy? And in this strategy, they, they re explicitly recognize how being undocumented makes a person more vulnerable to victimization. And the EU in the next five years, which is how long these strategies are going to last, um, it wants to look at exchanging good practices. So also what Pia had just ended on, kind of how can we share some of the good practices. Um, so I'd just like to conclude. Um, I have some figures, I can give you those later, but I think the figures, they, they all speak for themselves in different regions. Um, but basically just to conclude, um, that it, it has been interesting to look at what the pandemic has shared with us as lessons. Um, that we all know that if you don't treat everyone in the pandemic, um, you're not going to make any progress. You have to, public health knows no boundaries or passports or frontiers, so you have to treat everyone to have some kind of an impact. And we also saw that there were a number of practices in Europe, besides the ones that I've mentioned, there were also states that release people from detention, um, temporary suspensions of return, etc. But basically, we have five points that we wanted to make sure that going forward, we transform anything that's seen as emergency measures into more long lasting kind of policies. And the first one is that uh, to ensure that minimum income and other social protection schemes would apply to everyone in need without regard to migration status. The second one is on healthcare to ensure that everyone can access the full uh, complement of health services, so preventative and curative care, and that firewalls could be put in place so that they can practically also enjoy them. The third one would be that um, civil society organizations that are critical to connecting to marginalized communities could be empowered by having access to information, delivery services, and social support so that they can also reach these communities. Uh, the fourth one is that individuals who are undocumented could be prevented by having further irregularity um, by renewing, extending, or issuing residence permits. And there's actually a number of good examples to look at. And the last one is to end immigration detention and to favor alternatives to detention. So I'll, I'll, let, I'll stop it here because I know we don't want to take too much time in the beginning, um, but would be happy to um, draw upon anything in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, you know, some, some very interesting examples also from the European context. And I was, I was wondering, I'll, I'll, I'll just follow up with you with a question because I was wondering, um, you know, with the, with a few advocacy points you shared towards the end, um, I, I, I do see that they are a mix of one working on the issue of, you know, access to services and firewalls, which is, you know, one part of it, but also on, on regularization. And I was wondering if you see these as going together in the sense of preventing people becoming undocumented, undocumented, facilitating documentation, 
but also um, working on the on the advocacy of what happens when people become undocumented. Do you think this is is this because you you think this is inevitable one way or another? We will still have people who are undocumented, or because they go together. What's your what's your take on this? Yeah, thanks, Rula. I think it's a great question. Um, when we did this report on labor exploitation, looking at good practices of NGOs and trade unions in Europe and the United States many years ago, we called it 10 ways to protect undocumented workers. The nine ways were basically how do you help a worker who's undocumented once they have been exploited? So what can you practically do? And there were nine ways that we found, I mean, we just highlighted nine, there are many other ones, but those were just kind of exploratory. And the 10th way was regularization. So basically we felt you have to always do both um, because in a sense, uh, the undocumented population can, in a sense, be given um, status through regularization, but not everyone always benefits from regularization. So there are always, even with regularization schemes or ongoing programs in the law, there's always people who don't benefit from that. And also the way that governments are developing the regular pathways doesn't meet the demand. So even if they in, um, if they introduce more regular pathways, it's still not fulfilling the entire demand. Uh, tomorrow, the European Union will launch the new migration pact. So this is the whole strategy for the EU on migration in the next five years. We are most likely not going to see any new regular pathways, but we have various sectors of the economy in the EU where undocumented workers are quite present. Um, so we know that um, that will be continue to be a reality. And so that's why it's really important, we find, to always work uh, in both, to see it as a whole kind of picture and never just as one or the other. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Michelle. I think um, these are very important points from, from your intervention. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny that you, you talk about regular pathways. I will, I will try to go um, to Lala, actually, to weigh on this. I know, Lala, before you were cut in, you were, you were actually st starting your sentence by, by saying, you know, people come documented to the country and they become undocumented. So maybe can we, can we pick up on some of, some of what Michelle said about regular pathways into um, your intervention, which with a specific focus on, on children and the situation of children. Lala, let's hope the, the internet connection works this time. Yeah, I changed my connection, so hopefully I will be able to <clears throat> speak now and you can hear me. Um, so yeah, um, so as I was saying, like uh, a lot of uh, migrants, they become undocumented after entering uh, uh, regularly in regular pathways. Um, and then um, because of, for example, if employer, employers uh, confiscate uh, document, their documents, which is the practice in Lebanon, and uh, they quit their job and the documents stay with the employer and they never get it back. Um, or uh, if they are not renewed, for example. So there are many reasons why uh, migrant workers become undocumented. Uh, and then uh, just to uh, talk about children, that in these cases, children are uh, mostly, they are directly affected by the lack of documentation of their parents. Um, because in this case, they're not able to register their children uh, in the country, so they're not able to get residency permits. Um, we try uh, in our work like to assist uh, these families and children. We try with the embassies of origin, because at least like to be registered with the embassies of origin to get um, a nationality passport and stuff like that. But also there is a big challenge in that. Uh, it depends on the country of origin, but in some countries, for example, uh, a mother cannot uh, register uh, her children um, on, like, uh, on her name uh, if the father is known. So they, they ask us to go to the father's nationality, but a lot of times the father is not there. Uh, we don't know where he is. The mother doesn't know where he is. So this is a big challenge and the children stay undocumented and stateless, basically. Um, if the father is unknown and uh, there is no name of father anywhere, in that case, it is possible in some countries, like, like Lebanon, it's the same, to register uh, the children and the name of the mother if the only if the father is unknown. That's the only case, which is really rare. I mean, it's not something common. So it is very difficult in these cases. Um, I just wanted to share also, uh, ah, also there is something really important that in, uh, in many cases we have seen that um, 
uh, parents, mothers, or even fathers, like they uh, deliberate, deliberately don't declare their children to the Lebanese state because uh, it's been a few years that uh, gender security in Lebanon has been um, uh, issuing deportation orders for families or for women, basically, mo mostly women who have children in the country. So uh, as soon as they go to um, declare about their uh, child or to register to get residency permit for their child, when they are um, documented, huh? they, they have the residency, they, are, uh, they have everything uh, legally, uh, they have their work permit and everything, but that when they go and they try to uh, declare their children to make residency per permits for them, uh, a deportation order is issued um, because according to gender security, uh, migrant, migrant women uh, are here to work and not to have families or to have children. So in this case, like we have seen like many women, they just deliberately, like they don't declare that they have kids. Uh, un unless they are willing to, to, to go back, they're willing to leave the country. In that case, uh, they do it, so there's no problem. But if they want to stay, they will not declare that. So the children stay without um, residency permits, which is also like, which, which comes with a lot of challenges regarding registering in schools, getting healthcare, uh, getting a lot of services that would be very, very difficult for these women and their children. Um, I just wanted to share also something uh, that happened recently in Lebanon. Uh, in uh, July, uh, there has been uh, a new decree from the general security, I mean, something positive, <laughs> that um, they, have, uh, they have issued a decree saying that uh, they allow like an amnesty to regularize the status of, uh, of migrants, migrants uh, in general, uh, <clears throat> sorry, they say Arabs and non-Arabs, uh, Arabs and non-Arab migrants who are in uh, Lebanon, who are uh, living in irregularly, if you want. So this is what the decree says, who are irregular in the country. So they have, um, they have uh, said like from end of July until end of October, they have this three months to regularize their status. So uh, even if they entered clandest clandestinely, so they don't have, they have entered uh, without any, uh, visa or any work permit or whatever, so they are able to um, issue, like to regularize their status if they have an employer, of course. Uh, and then if their uh, papers are expired, uh, also they can uh, apply for this um, regularization. Or if they want to change their employer, this is something new. So if they want to change their employer, they are able to do it without the permission or the approval of the previous employer. So this was not possible before. Before you had to get the uh, approval of the previous employer to change your employer, to, to change the employer to a new employer. So in this case, it is possible. Um, and they also give like uh, three months, they give you, uh, they give a, a temporary visa so that the worker can, can get a work permit during this period. And then they can get uh, their residency after that. And they say like, if the three months are not enough, to find an employer and to get a work permit, they, they can extend it two more months. So in total, they have five months to, uh, to find an employer and to apply for a work visa, and then uh, they can go back and do their residency. So this is something we thought like it's really, um, it's positive, it's new. And I think it came after uh, the economic crisis and the COVID-19 and everything, and everyone wanting to leave Lebanon basically. <laughs> So um, a lot of migrants, a lot of, um, uh, yeah, I mean, most of migrants, they, they, they're now like a lot of them left and uh, many of them want to leave. So that's why we see like some reforms uh, in Lebanon. Uh, also, like there was this uh, proposition from the Minister of Labor of a new um, unified contract for domestic workers, where it also like uh, gives the, um, the, the domestic worker the right to change employers without the consent of the previous employer, which was not possible before. And it also gives uh, the domestic worker the right, uh, not the right, like it, it says like domestic worker has to have her documents or his documents uh, with, with him or her at all times uh, with their possession, in their possession. I mean, this was not, uh, this was not the case before. Um, before it was the employer who withheld the, all, the, all the documents. So now they say like very um, clearly that it has to be with the employer, um, sorry, uh, with, the, with the migrant worker. 
uh, and uh, I mean, the migrant worker is responsible for her or his documents. Um, so these are these are new um, new initiatives or new uh, things from the government. I mean, they are steps. They are they are. Uh, positive steps, but I mean, it's not enough, of course. And uh, some people were talking like, especially like from government, they're talking like, this is the end of the kafala, but we are a bit skeptical about this. Like, it's not, it's not totally uh, correct. I mean, there are small steps, but it's not the end of the kafala, of course, like we have a lot to do. There are a lot of steps to be taken yet, I mean, to, to reach there. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know, Rula, if uh, I covered like uh, your question or is there anything else? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lala. No, and I think you, I mean, there is, there is something that you said, which, res, you know, which really kind of connects to what Pia was saying about uh, being undocumented also as a choice, right? Uh, people not declaring uh, their family members precisely because they exist within systems that does not make it possible for them to have families and then to have to enjoy these family rights. So undocumentation is a is a better choice and a very bad kind of a choice menu uh, somehow, which is very interesting to hear. I was wondering, Lala, because you've touched on, on the whole question of, you know, registration of birth, on, on requirements and, and, you know, whether from Lebanon's side, but also from the countries of origins, um, you know, side in terms of who is, who is allowed to register and under what conditions. Do you think there is a you know very high burden being placed on migrants, and does this burden need to be simplified? How what needs to happen also with you know on, on the destination side, but also on the countries of origin or the mission side of things? Exactly, exactly. As I was mentioning, like in many countries, um, the mother does not have the right to register or to give the nationality uh, to her children. So this is a big challenge, and it is a big like uh, obstacle. Uh, for mothers who have children in, in different countries, like to register, uh, or a lot of times they have to give up their children because they cannot take them with them when they leave the country. Um, also in Lebanon, like it's really complicated uh, when the child becomes over one year old, you need to have like a court decision, you need to have DNA tests, you need to have a lawyer. I mean, it's not something that a migrant can do on their own. So it is really like, it is, it is complicated and it is a difficult uh, procedure. Um, we have worked on this several, in, on like several occasions and we know that it is complicated, even for us like as NGO, as we have lawyers on board and it is complicated, it is hard, it's not easy process and it takes a lot of time as well. No, thanks, thanks very much, Lala. It's, um... It's really sometimes just to look at the steps involved in some of these cases, it's, it's really mind blowing. So thank you. Thank you for that. And, and hopefully we'll come back for, to you with, with some other questions. Um, maybe here we can, we can go to, to Gopal and, and take this conversation in, in a little bit of a different direction. We talked about you know, labor migrants. We talked about migrants in countries of destination and, and you know documentation in that context meaning in, in the context of destination but but my question to you Gopal and Gopal you've, you've been someone who followed very closely the the GCM and the GCR and obviously apron as a refugee rights network you are very much concerned with the question of refugees makes flows but also on you know migrant workers and my question to you is is looking at is looking at the issue of documentation from the perspective of this is a migrant, this is a refugee, uh, this is someone in, in mixed situations. Is it helpful or, or does it even complicate our lives even more with people being um, you know, asked to do different things because of different statuses? Um, mm -hmm. I, see, I see before we go to you, I see the poll is finally working. So let's try to vote on the poll. Um, and then we'll, we'll go to you, uh, Gopal and Rakesh. Let me know when this is done. Is it done? We are sharing mm -hmm. in the chat box. Okay, so we'll, we'll share this in the chat box. Gopal, we go to you now. All right. Uh... Thank you. Thank you, Rola, first of all, inviting me in this uh, very, very important uh, platform. 
and I am so honored to be part of the distinguished panelists who have uh, time tested and time honored uh, experience uh, uh, in in the field of uh, you know documentation of uh, the uh, migratory flow. Um, yes, I. Uh, so I would like to uh, set up some, set up some 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 context with regards to uh, what what happens with regards to uh, non documentation uh, uh, and and what are the what are the key challenges and how can we fix it actually so uh, what we can see is in the uh, like across the globe there is about like what 1.1 billion individuals lack legal identity and out of the you know migrants or total migrants, ten percent plus minus are, are in ir irregular condition. So, uh, being irregular, as has been already highlighted by our previous sp speakers, that uh, the the that means there is an absence of state state's acknowledgement of the existence and their legal status. That means it prevents the critical critically important state protection, uh, including basically the right to education line our. You know, uh, participants are also writing on the chat box with regards to right to education of children, the health care, freedom of movement, and of course, the primarily the access to justice. This is because of the existing discriminatory laws and gaps, or, or gaps in the laws, uh, which are found in most of the uh, host uh, countries or countries of destination. So who suffers the most, again, among the migrants here is I mean, uh, the disproportionate impact is uh, faced by, uh, by on, on the basis of race, on the basis of ethnicity and linguistic and religious and other minorities, you know, context, you know. So, so there, are, uh, there are victims, uh, but there are, uh, you know, hardest hit victims among the victims too. So I think that point that needs to be taken into consideration while we are talking about uh, documentation. And uh, the the well, how how does this stem is is uh, this is basically because of the arbitrary application of laws in most of the countries, or very weak civil registration we, which have seen, or administrative and practical barriers, or or even combination of all. So in this context. Uh, so, living undocumented or underdocumented, or people in the state of like statelessness, or even without uh, effective citizenship, that means is is preventing um, millions from reaching their full human potential. And migrants are the hardest hit. Here, I, I will I will talk a little bit about what mixed migration is. But I am I'm, let me let me allow to focus on the impact first, because. It also marginalizes the entire communities. You know, it it is not only an individual, but the entire family, the you know the society, the community. So in some cases, it even fuels discontent or even conflict, and even further displacement. And thus, people after displacement have to take irregular irregular path. So, uh, so uh, in, in some, uh, it's all uh, associated with. Uh, with with this you know existence so they, they they exist but at the same time they do not exist because the the law of the land of the particular country uh, doesn't recognize them so here um, for every single you know people on the move uh, it could be a refugees and asylum seekers or even rejected asylum seekers or victims of trafficking or you know or smuggled migrants or even unaccompanied and separated children, or regular migrants, or overseas, uh, overseas contractual laborers, and who, who, who travel on a, uh, on, a, on a regular documentation, or stranded migrants, or, or other stateless person, or, or other, other like uh, uh, vulnerable migrants, such as you know the displaces due to climate or disaster, uh, or disaster, other forms of disaster. So. Here, um, the key question is: Now, the uh, the, un the 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 first ticket to long haul life journey is birth registration. I think that should be established as a, as a universal principle, which uh, as a non-negotiable uh, or kind of you know approach. 
Second is about other right to registration. Like there are examples in some countries where refugees are allowed for you know, birth, birth registration, but their what is called death, their death and migration and you know, marriage and divorce uh, kind of documentation is not allowed. We have case example even in my own country, especially for Tibetan refugees. So, so the vital registration is licensed to survive. So it's a state recognition uh, of the presence and existence of the person and individual and a human being is a must. So, uh, so the good news is in some countries there are like the, the like the vital registration is issued by the national registration scheme. So the authorities will do the same design and specification. Uh, which is applied to documentation of uh, the, the local nationals. Uh, but in many countries, it's not happening. In the case of refugees, there are mixed kind of, you know, uh, kind of uh, models. Uh, in some countries, it is a you know, joint project with UNHCR and the you know, host country. And in some countries, it is only the government. Uh, and uh, like, like in Korea and, and in Japan, and in some countries, it's not the government, but the UNHCR uh, provides this kind of ID cards with UNHCR logo. So there are there are different kind of you know uh, models uh, applied in different contexts. So, but, so uh, going back to your question, uh, Rola, uh, about uh, understanding how you know because there there, there is a conceptual unclarity about uh, about uh, the the mixed mixed migration. Uh, what constitutes mixed migration, and then how? Like for example, uh, if you talk about one category of one category, one category of unaccompanied child, but the unaccompanied child also could be an asylum seeker at the same time, and then, so so irregular migration, since it's so common form of movement across the globe, mixed migration flows is also an accurate reflection of the diversity of migration itself so that needs to be recognized that needs to be you know, realized by all stakeholders and but unfortunately vast majority of our migrants in my mixed migratory flows uh, do not fit any particular level particularly in terms of established legal category i think that needs to be changed that needs to be altered so uh, uh, the, this is all about the conceptual you know, clarity because varieties of people for different reasons with different aims and objectives keep traveling. People do travel. It's a natural phenomenon. So, but the, uh, but, but, uh, the, the, the countries, uh, particularly the, the, the countries in destination should have what, uh, what, what we call is comprehensive uh, preparedness to deal with mixed migratory flow with uh, different kind of protocols and approaches because people uh, don't put the people on the same basket because there are people with varieties of needs as i already mentioned there are asylum seekers there are sick there are elderly there are children there are pregnant women there you know, there are like uh, students or you know uh, uh, probably economic migrants or you know varieties of people so the, but most of the time uh, on the basis of what we call is securitization migration, every single you know people on the move has been put on a single basket. I think they here realize the critical and crux of the problem. So uh, uh, there are uh, many other kind of you know approaches that can be taken. For example, uh, one of our colleagues already mentioned about uh, exploring non-custodial alter alternatives in terms of immigration detention, for example, and also. Uh, identification of the victims and survivor, uh, survivors uh, on the move and, and the persecution of all forms of violence is, is so much important, uh, you know, particularly in bo both in the country of uh, origin as well as in the country of destination. And then the law, now the question is about law enforcement agencies and border officials needs to be trained accordingly. Uh, the, the training ser uh, service should be catered accordingly because they should be smart enough, you know, to isolate and to find out uh, and to categorize through proper screening and documentation of uh, what the, the motive. And they should be allowed to, you know, uh, in a way, you know, uh, have their say on their claim, like why, why are they coming there, you know? So I think, so in totality, I'm talking about the 
the, the putting uh, protection sensitive reception as a priority. I think that's the cross of the problem. And then when the protection sensitive reception is there in every single uh, countries of destination, then the 80% uh, the or 90% problem is solved because that would categorize the motivation of people coming there. You know, so that is uh, the the most important kind of you know approach, which has also been derived in many many instruments, including the you know 2018 uh, both the global compact for migration and refugees, and there are many other you know exercises and mechanics already uh, there, particularly in intergovernmental initiatives. Uh, I don't have time to you know name everyone, but the UNHCR, World Bank, you know, and there are many declarations in the Great Lakes region. You know, Arab uh, League's uh, Ministerial Declaration on Legal Identity, uh, Africa Program on Vital Statistics, and you know, Regional Strategic Plan in the Asia Pacific on Vital Statistics, EU, and you know, there are many other places, uh, you know, instruments and mechanisms already in place. That needs to be, you know, uh, mobilized, that needs to be utilized fullest, you know, in, in this uh, connection. Thanks, Gopal. No, and I, I really like what you said on, uh, you know, yes, we, we shouldn't put people in the same basket in the sense of, um, you know, not treating everybody the same. And you, you are arguing for, for doing this on the basis of needs, right? This is what you said, uh, you know, yep. treat people based on the basis of needs. But at the same time, and especially in what you've mentioned in the context of mixed migration and the context of labor migration and the context of refugee movement, there are certain hierarchies, if we can say, right? There are certain hierarchies in terms of what kind of documentation you possess. Um, a, a refugee in possession of a refugee documentation, for instance, is somebody who is entitled to international protection. Um, in the GCM, there was always the struggle of how do we, you know, kind of expand this protection to, to migrants. So there is that. And I, and I mean, one perfect example that comes to mind is Egypt, for instance, where you know, because of the, you know, fluidity in, in these kinds of movements and the mixed migration movements and the advantages of, well, of, of a refugee status, everybody that applies for asylum, um, virtually everybody that can applies for asylum, for instance, because there are these uh, kinds of hierarchies. But let me ask you, let me ask you this, Gopal, because you, you're saying that um, let's treat people on the basis of needs. And you've made a very good case on, on, on the documentation of the different groups. But do you think is documentation is, is a, such a key concept um, that, that if it remains and it if it expands and if we, we adopt this concept of needing to document everybody and every movement and all of this, uh, we will risk um, not realizing the SDG 16, which is on, on inclusive societies. Um, you think there's a trade-off here between inclusion and then adopting a, um, a position which is very pro-documentation and pro-differentiating uh, bet between different categories of people on the move? Yeah, wonderful question, actually. Uh, first, of all, uh, first of all, as, uh, as uh, Madam Pia also already mentioned about uh, some of the human rights-based approaches to be applied for all people on the move, that includes the, all the categories that has been uh, mentioned earlier. So uh, certain principles uh, needs to be in place. Uh, you know, for example, uh, the, the, the principle of non reformo uh, which is always uh, somehow is still debatable in the GCM, uh, but there has been the, 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 the terminology as such has not been mentioned categorically, but uh, overall the language also speaks that the states are committed for non reformo uh, uh, somehow. So I think the principle of non reformo uh, should be, or non deportation should be, uh, I think, the critical part of uh, the, uh, the, the overall approach. And secondly, uh, non criminalization. I think this makes a lot of sense because uh, many, many uh, you know, people in the move also arrive without uh, proper documentation or forced documentation because that is absolutely required for their own survival and protection because they're, whenever their life is in threat and people do come. I'll give you an example. One Somalian, Somalian refugee arrived in Nepal with, uh, with an original Swedish passport, but later on the UNHCR through its screening process came to know that well, the guy was a real, genuine asylum seeker, refugees, but he was holding a forced passport. You know, so that so in, on that basis, 
uh, the first person was not criminalized, you know, one great example. So, so non-criminalization on the basis of the documentation or the status of how the people reach to the border is, 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 should be a fundamental uh, kind of you know, approach. Uh, and because uh, it is so important to realize the, the fact that people do you know, take a dangerous journey, you know, for their safety and protection, uh, protection of their families, etc. You know, particularly in the case of asylum seekers. So, non-criminalization on the basis of on the on the face value, what you call the prima facie, and again, as uh, Madam P also already, you know, uh, you know, emphasized about the principle of non-discrimination on the basis of the race, origin, ethnicity, religion, uh, sexual orientation, gender. Uh, disability and other forms, you know. So I think these uh, human rights based, based approaches, uh, which are very much part of the all international human rights instruments, including uh, you know these 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 languages have been you know somehow spilled out in the global compact uh, for migration as well as uh, refugees. I think those uh, those uh, so those particular themes, particular components, uh, needs to be. I think amplified by the civil society uh, as, as a top priority. But at the same time, so registering systematically and recording all these, you know, uh, you know, the arrival and vital events of everyone, uh, refugees and migrants within their, you know, with, within the national civil registry, it, it should be the focus that we have. Let's reiterate that, you know, number one. And number two, what I'm trying to say is about yes, there, it, there, there is a, it is important, you know. To also process in a differentiated, you know, technique and tool on case by case basis, but to me, but the purpose is not to exclude, but to include everyone, but again to identify the particular protection needs of each vulnerable individual. So that is the thrust behind my uh, saying about need based, you know, differentiated protocol and processes, but not to discriminate anyone or not to criminalize anyone. And finally, because it. Because uh, for for people on the move, um, it is important, particularly in in mixed migratory flow, it is important to recognize the immediate physical, uh, medical, and psychological needs of an individual. So let, the person should be taken as an individual because people might need urgent attention, and then so that should be because there are referral processes, there are shelters and reception facilities, everything, but before sending the people to the shelters or referral or reception or, uh, you know, or, or any other facilities, I'm mostly talking about uh, uh, vulnerably moving population or people you know, crossing the borders that, that uh, the attention should be given to address their you know, physical, medical and psychological needs. So, in, in total, in, in totality, what I mean to say is that um, mixed migration mobility needs to be recognized. And then, so, uh, so the preparation on the part of the, you know, uh, what you call uh, protection uh, sensitive reception modalities is the demand of the day. Uh, so, uh, so, so, see other procedure at, as which I mentioned earlier needs to be in place accordingly. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Gopal, for this um, uh, clarification as well. Pia, can I can I go back to you? I mean, I I wanted to follow up with you after we've heard that we've heard some of our panelists. I wanna I wanna go back to you and ask you: Can we say that uh, the denial of documentation, whether it is done on purpose or or not on purpose, can it amount to 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 an infringement on the right to life to migrants? Can we say that? We can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Sorry, Pia. Okay. She's on mute. Too. She didn't. She's on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Good. Um. So sorry. You said the denial of the right uh, of of identification could result in. The denial of the right to life. Um, I mean, that's certainly possible. Um, and I think it really comes back to, uh, and I think Gopal mentioned it just now, this idea that 
why is documentation an important that you know so important that it's in the human rights standards it's in the gcm up front and it's about giving effect to human rights um uh, obligations for states it's about giving effect to the human rights entitlements that we have and i think that that's where there is this tension because um you've been talking a little bit about you know avoiding a hierarchy of of, of, of rights uh, avoiding a hierarchy of people that are entitled to to rights or not but what we've done in this system i take and and, and I'm, i'm all about kind of trying to interrogate at the moment you know kind of structural systems because i think what we've done is we've created structurally we international community has has created a situation where status is predicated on documents and the ability to have one document or the other a refugee document and asylum seeker document you know a migrant worker document and that enables you to access your rights or not now clearly there's something wrong with this picture because if we say that rights are universal that they're not predicated on status that they attach to the human being not the place they are you know my birthright because i'm a human being then it shouldn't require a piece of paper for me to be able to assert that right and this is obviously the problem for undocumented migrants you know in all uh, regions of the world and i'm particularly also thinking about thinking about you know the examples that michel was giving um uh, looking at you know kind of really these protracted situations of of irregularity of undocumentedness that that we see whether it is about um children you know migrant women in Lebanon having children um and 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 not being able to register you know the, the fundamental act of having a child and 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 nurturing a child as a mother that you're not able to register this child because a administrative status said that you shouldn't so i think yeah i mean it, it, it's 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 i'm becoming a little bit philosophical here but but also you know i mean the I, i'm not sure and and i think that's why there is a need to for the kind of grassroots action that i was talking about really for us to get together to to work with uh, the the jurists to work with uh, the the state structures because i don't know that we have all of the answers to get where we need to go we've got the problems there we've got human rights law that says that it's universal but i think how we operationalize that universality is is where is the next challenge and i think that having um this right in the gcm is a start um but again as i said everybody on the call i think this is your you know your time now to to really unpack what that means to be able to have a meaningful impact on people's lives thanks for that tia and it's um it's interesting how how you phrase it it's um you know it's about the, the status is is depending on it depends on the documents which depend on so many layers so it's uh, it's going around creating these systems uh, like a domino effect and the absence of one piece then means you know you can't go to the next level and i think um you know you just also got me thinking about you know what are that the more systems we create and the more layers we put the more people we are going to exclude along the way and the question then becomes how do we make sure that people are are you know are not left out of this of these systems and how do we work on this and i think what michel was talking about in terms of the points is really something for us to to also consider going forward we will we'll go back to you hopefully we'll have time to do that uh but before i go to tendai i i see that the poll fine is finally working which is something um and i just to flag some of the results and i think it's a it's a mixed result out there because um the question was why why do we consider documentation to be important and people could pick more than one answer and so the answer that got the most um number of votes is that it allows access to services um followed by it allows proof of identity uh with immigration authorities and lastly that it ensures safe and hassle free return it's an interesting poll because the results are are very close and i think if one thing it tells us it tells us that all of all of these are relevant um so thank you very much i'm not sure if we'll manage to to get another poll going in this session we're still experimenting with this um so 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 bear with us on this but let me move to tendai because i think we've been we've been touching on on the question of statelessness on and off we we've, we've talked about children who are born in countries of destination 
who are not necessarily registered. We've talked about people who you know don't don't have access to all sorts of birth registrations and all of this. And obviously, the 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 notion of statelessness is something that is much bigger than just in the realm of migration, but in migration in particular, it's it's very pe pertinent. And I, we've heard a lot about you know the situations of children as well, born in countries of destination. But can you make the linkages between those two issues, between the issue of statelessness and the issue of documentation in the context of, of migration? Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is it working? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. So first, I just wanted to say it's an honor to join such a huge group of people doing such important work, both on the panel and, um, and not on the panel. <laughs> and I want to make sure there's time for discussion. So I'll keep it short. I want to do a little bit of definitional discussion and then mention four key challenges, I think, that face us in considering the GCM in this context. Um, so first of all, what do we, when I say stateless, what do I mean? Well, Pia kind of alluded to the problem that it's a lot more complex than just the legal definition. But as I know, we've got a mixed group. In case it's helpful, the legal definitions comes from the 1954 Statelessness Convention, which refers to a stateless person as someone who is not, um, is not treated as a national by any state under the operation of its law. Um, and based on that definition alone, we know that there are either 10 million according to UNHCR or 15 million according to ISI people who meet that definition in the world, probably more, that's quite a conservative estimate. But in fact, as it has been mentioned by lots of people, the um, challenges associated with statelessness affect a lot more people than just those who meet that definition. And one other challenge in using this terminology, and um, lots of statelessness activists have been asking people to try to think about how they use the word stateless and to be careful about whether in using that terminology, there's a risk of reinforcing um, states uh, activities, saying that these people are not citizens. Some people say, no, I'm a citizen. And by using the word stateless, you're almost taking the state side in saying that I'm not. So people say I'm a citizen, but the state's not recognizing me. So that's just some, uh, terminological uh, challenges that face us. And who are these populations? I know that lots of people in the call will know who I'm talking about, but on the one hand, you have large, well-known populations all over the world from Rohingya in Asia, those identified as um, Haitian and Dominican Republic, um, Roma across Europe. But you also have, as has been alluded to, um, people in, we know in almost every country on earth, likely in, in fact, every country on earth, who find themselves um, without any citizenship for a number of reasons, including associated with migration and the documentary problems uh, throughout the migration cycle. So that's who, <laughs> who uh, I'm referring to. And um, Pia actually asked us to examine the intent of the GCM. And that's what I'm gonna start with, with my first question, my first challenge, is are migration policies really about migration at all? Because when you consider the impact of migration policies on people who don't have any citizenship, irrespective of whether they have ever left home, it becomes clear that migration policies are not really affecting people insofar as they move. They're affecting people insofar as they are not members of a particular community or are not recognized or given a status by a particular state. And you can see that because people who have citizenship of nowhere irrespective of whether they've moved, are, because of migration policies, often blocked from irregular work, uh, blocked from access to bank accounts, to education, to justice, healthcare, all the things that we know undocumented migrants are affected by, because these are people without documentation often, or with documentation that doesn't give them access to these things. And they also don't have access to regular migration routes. And Gopal mentioned detention. Well, one thing that's mentioned by people without citizenship anywhere again and again is the risk of detention, which is often indefinite because when people don't have citizenship of anywhere, there's nowhere to, to which they can be deported. So any kind of detention is going to be arbitrary and it may well be indefinite if not repeated regularly. So the first challenge I put to us is whether we're actually talking about migration at all or whether these policies are using the logic of migration management to drive something else that's about exclusion and status. That's my first challenge. My second challenge is, to, is that we are faced with is the idea that everyone needs access to an appropriate citizenship, but that's not enough. 
and that legal identity and documentation is also not enough. So there's a, sometimes a risk of missing um, underlying problems. So people have already mentioned a lot of the details. I'm going to leave the detail out and just uh, talk about the, the issues that I think arise as a result. So, for example, the GCM asks to make sure uh, recognition of legal identity for everyone. However, people who are working, I can see people are working in countries where there are significant populations who have a legal identity that explicitly precludes them from access to citizenship whether that's the non-citizen Badoon in Kuwait or the, um, the non-citizens of Estonia, these are legal identities for which people hold documents. But these legal identities preclude people from citizenship and in enforce a lack of rights. So one challenge is to think about the risk of legal identity. But not only that, because we also know that citizenship in and of itself is insufficient. So if we look at what the UAE did recently when they purchased um, Comoros citizenship to try to end statelessness in the country, what they created was a Comorian minority in the UAE. They didn't remove the problems associated with statelessness for those people. So we need to wonder whether, what, uh, whether by focusing on the very important issues of documentation of legal identity and of access to citizenship, it's also important to make sure that that comes with addressing discrimination and the reasons why people are being blocked from documents and from citizenship in the first place. Um, I could say more, but I'm trying to keep it brief to mention my four challenges. My third challenge is really has been said again and again, I'll say it yet again, the idea that basic rights need to be available without citizenship. And it's not enough just to review and revise the requirements. And that's for two main reasons. So on the one hand, several people have mentioned the inconsistency, the idea that we have rights that are justified on the basis of universality and that everyone should have access to them. And then to make it impossible for some people to get to, to access them, that this just seems inconsistent. You could call them citizen rights if you want, but if we're gonna say there are human rights, and I think we need to, then humans need to have access to them irrespective of status. But also, making these rights dependent on citizenship undermines the nature of citizenship. Because as we've heard, there's people who, for various reasons, don't um, uh, use their documentation or indeed might reject citizenship for all kinds of reasons, including political ones. And if, um, if very basic human rights are tied onto citizenship, then there's a risk that citizenship itself also begins to lose its meaning and becomes just an organizational category, which a lot of the logic around exclusion from citizenship precludes. So that, that's my third thought. And my fourth thought is that a lot of the, so we, we've been talking a lot about people who move, and it's quite easy to imagine how migration policies might affect people who move. But what I suggest is that a lot of the impacts of migration policies on those without citizenship who may not move are hidden for those who aren't affected. And so the only way to address this issue is the inclusion of those who are affected, who don't have access to any citizenship. They need to be part of designing migration policies to make sure that they don't inadvertently or even advertently affect people who have no citizenship at all. That's my four thoughts. <laughs> wow. <laughs> very, very deep four thoughts, then I, you know, thanks a lot for this. And I think, um, you know, what, what is really striking is how you put it, migration policies is not about migration at all. Um, and when you phrase it like this, I think it really gets us um, thinking and digging. And I, I mean, I already, I already think I, I, I know how you, your answer would be to this one, because in one way or another, you've said it, but let me ask you this. Um, do you think that as we are putting kind of these documentations um, documentation requirements and building these complicated systems and all of this, are we kind of making it harder and harder for people to move? Well, actually, I think it's complicated. So there was an interesting study done by De Haas and Chaika recently. You can tell I'm an academic, I can't help myself. There was an interesting study done recently where they analyzed migration policies over time. And they suggest actually we are, well, apart from the past six months, we're moving in a period with increasingly free movement for some, 
with increasingly blocked movement for others. So it's, I, I would slightly challenge, Rula, what you said to suggest, I don't think it makes it harder and harder to move per se. It just makes it more and more distinct, those who are allowed to move about the world and those who aren't. Thanks, thanks a lot. That's, um, that is also important to, to kind of reflect, and maybe we haven't reflected on this sufficiently in this webinar, how these affect different groups of people differently. Thanks for flagging this. Um, I, will, I want to ask you a question, Michelle, but before I do that, let me just um, you know, call on a few people to prepare themselves. I'll ask you the question and then we'll go to the floor. Uh, but I think if Evelyn is still with us, it would be really good to hear from you. Amish, Amish Karki, Cecily Kern, uh, Eva Sanders, I know is on the webinar as well. It'd be great to hear from you. And Berenice, um, if you are here, I will try to call on you uh, before, before kind of, um, after actually, I, I kind of come back to, 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 the, um, to the floor for interactions. But Michelle, can I, just based on, you know, um, what Tendai is talking about, what, you know, the, the hierarchies and, and the, you know, this is about rights and the inconsistencies within these frameworks. Can I ask you the question of, at the end, you know, what's your assessment? Is this really about rights and dignities or is it something more about politics and, and then, you know, as evidence with what happened in the GCM and the aftermath of the GCM in the European context? What's your assessment? Is it about is it about migration and rights or is it about politics and, and other stuff? Thanks for your question, Rula. And you're asking it on the eve of the launch of the EU Action Migration Pact. And and I think it's it, it'll be interesting uh, for those of us who will see this tomorrow and for those of you who are also following it to see how the EU also frames this, because I'm sure that they will say it's about rights, of course that we have values in this region um, and the migration policy should, adhere, policy should adhere to them. But I think what many of us feel is that once you translate, what does it really mean when you use these words, human rights and social inclusion and integration and protection, how do you translate that to policies and how do you make sure the policies aren't exclusionary? That's where I think there's still a big gap. Um, so just as an example, what we expect will come out tomorrow from this new migration pact will be a, um, a view of migration that looks at um, the whole issue of migration for the region, mainly in an enforcement methodology. So like tying in migration with security, making sure that return is really key, not really having many regular pathways, children, um, I think it's really good that Lala talked about children. That's one of the key concerns for this region. Um, years ago, like when the European Commission was launching its migration uh, policies, you know, they're every couple of years. And so they launch new ones, um, you know, at certain time periods. We were saying that uh, children might be a footnote um, in the, the actual document. We would hope for more than a footnote this time, but there's still a perception that unaccompanied children have a lot of things that they deserve, but lo and behold, if those children are, void, are traveling with their parents, they don't deserve the same types of protections because their parents are with them. So there's still a lot of perceptions even about a group such as children that some are even more deserving than others of protection. And so I think when we see how all of these things translate into real policies, this is really where the gap is. Um, if everyone needed to be covered in the pandemic, we should have seen countries issue firewall policies immediately because undocumented could spread the pandemic just like any of us could. But they would fear going to get health care or fear going to the hospital if they had COVID uh, because they could be deported um, to the immigration authorities. So we don't see this, um, I would say this move to really going beyond rhetoric about rights uh, to really translating that into policies. And, and this is what we need to look at going forward. And I think Pia's um, suggestion also at the end, I think of when she was saying the second time of really um, just at the grassroots level, trying to, to look at examples of promising practices where we can see different policymakers 
recognize undocumented migrants' human rights in practice and challenge authorities who don't recognize them, this is what we need to also produce more. Um, because this is also how we have shown and throughout the global compact of migration negotiation process that many uh, European governments actually had measures in place for decades on undocumented migrants' access to healthcare or education. Many of the EU governments themselves weren't really aware of those rights that they themselves had. Their negotiators in New York weren't really up to date about some of those things. So it was a whole, in a sense, educational process, not only for the other member states, but for them as well. But we need to, in a sense, break some of the taboos because there's a lot of things that are also going on. Nothing is perfect. Um, we all recognize that. Um, even these, these instances that I gave of these measures in the pandemic, it's something, but it's definitely a kind of a drop. Uh, it's, it's, it's never going to be the full level of protection, but we need to show what governments and other actors are doing, basically, and challenge them when they're not doing them. Thank you. No, thanks, Michelle. And it's, uh, yeah, I mean, declaration on the on the one hand and political will on, on the other hand is, is two, two different things, um, unfortunately. Thank you for that. Uh, let me let me try and, and take Evelyn from the floor. Evelyn, you're here. Evelyn, if you're trying to speak, we can't hear you. Okay, then maybe not. Um, Amish, are you here? Okay, I think I think it's um, it's one of those days when when technology is not really working for us. Uh, <laughs> okay, then I'll, I'll Berenice, are you? Do you hear us? Are you here? No, Berenice seems to have left. <laughs> Okay. Ellen, can I surprise you? I always surprise you. Ellen Sana? Yeah, what is it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> would you like to come in for a minute or, or so with your take on yeah, things? Yeah, on, on what? <laughs> on, on documentation. Ah, documentation. Yeah, actually, I, I was about to put in the chat box that uh, documentation or identity documents for that matter should help facilitate access to services and uh, of the migrants or the individual, including um, uh, enjoyment of, of other rights, of the, his or her other rights, and not to hamper. And of course, as we also know uh, from what's happening in the ground and, and based on the inputs from our resource persons, it is being used to actually put up barriers for the enjoyment of the, the rights of the migrants or the individuals for them to, they regulate who can access or who cannot access uh, services and all that. So, and I think I also added in the chat box that this whole issue of documentation can go all the way to, you know, it covers the entire cycle of migration, but also beyond migration. Currently, we have cases of migrants who died on site, and it takes several months for the body to be shipped because they have to establish the identity of the person and the relationship of the person with the, with the, the families who will be receiving the body. So that's first first issue. The second issue is death claims, benefits uh, uh, associated with with the death, so gratuity pay and all that. And again, it and up to now the person who died was like in March, and up to this time, the, the family has yet to collect the gratuity, which is not even government money. But it's actually already earned. And again, I remember the wage theft issue. This is already earned benefit. But then because they cannot, they're not yet satisfied with the requirements, with the documentary requirements being presented by the heirs, they are not getting the money. So, you know, so we have to be conscious of these things as well. So 
So it's not only about the, the, the life of the migrant in the country of destination, but even beyond, you know, even when they have returned or if they returned in the cafe, these issues of papers are blocking the way to enjoyment, to the full enjoyment of the rights of our people or the individual. So that's all. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, um, Alan, for this point. Uh, Sumita? Thank you, Rula. Uh, the point I wanted to make was an uh, example where, it, where a country has legalization processes where hmm. they have, Can where they allow, sorry, where they allow for uh, workers to be, where they allow workers to be uh, documented. Uh, these kind of processes, unfortunately, de are dependent on the employer or, uh, you know, uh, not the migrant. The migrant does not have the ability to legalize themselves. It is always uh, dependent on the employer to legalize the, legalize the worker. So, so I think this is a process that is not very beneficial and it does not serve the purpose. And that is why whenever you see a legalization process being, being um, implemented, a very small number of undocumented workers get legalized because they don't have access direct access to that kind of process. They have to uh, either pay money to the, to the agents or they have to pay money to the employer uh, to legalize the worker themselves. So I think this is something the, the governments have to look into the legalize, legalization process where the migrants should have uh, access to legalize themselves rather than being dependent on the employer especially if it is, uh, uh, you know, if it's a, a sort of like a legalization process, not the normal work process, but the legalization process. So I, that's the point I would like to make. Thank you. Thank you, Sumi Rajiman. Can you hear me, Rola? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Rola. So, see, uh, during this COVID-19 outbreak in the Arab Gulf, thousands of undocumented workers got trapped in a very bad situation. They were either laid off by their employees much before the COVID outbreak or during the COVID outbreak. Interestingly, what happened is that when the Arab, Arab governments announced the amnesties for the overstaying and undocumented workers, they set a certain period which, in which many of these undocumented workers didn't fall. And eventually, many undocumented workers had to approach the embassies, but they were turned away from the embassies and they had to wait for the charity money raised by the organizations to pay the fine for overstaying and come back on charity flights. Even during the pandemic, uh, it was very sad to learn and see that undocumented workers uh, were not given uh, access to the health services, access to justice, and even an access to or have to have a decent, safe returning also. They were pushed to pay the fines. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Reggie, uh, for making this point. Uh, I wonder if Eva Richter would want to come in at this stage. Sorry. Eva, would you like to, to come in? Um, I'm sorry, I think I've been having some trouble here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Um, I'm very, very conscious of the fact that uh, lack of documentation makes it impossible for one not only to move freely, but also to receive the, um, the um, benefits of the society for which people have the, uh, the uh, human right to do so. And um, I was very much impressed by what Michelle said about the gap between the rhetoric of the, um, of the um, uh, migration process and the implementation in political terms. That is indeed where the gap is. And unless the case can be made for regularization and for citizenship, full citizenship, 
uh, it is not possible to gain the benefits for which one is uh, certainly hoping to which one certainly has the right. So documentation, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the most important things uh, in not only the process of uh, migration, but in the implementation, the political implementation as well. And that takes political will. I am very concerned, of course, as we all are, um, about the implementation on the political level of the uh, GCM. And that is where I think we need to bend our, um, our efforts uh, using many of the very, very good examples that have been given this morning of uh, best practices in, in that regard. Thanks a lot, Eva. Um, Mohammed Farhat, I know you had a few comments in the chat box. Would you like to pick up on some of these? Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, just uh, the comments is uh, to raise or to shed a light on the important thing about uh, the first restoration system in different countries, especially in the MENA regions, because I say we have uh, problems. And as Ms. Lala mentioned, that the, if the children pass across uh, one year, all they face a problem to register. So my my focus will be on the uh, the situation of the children who resulted from rape. Because in, it's not common in some countries, especially in Arab countries, Islam countries, to approach the registration or civil registration office and uh, ask the officials that we need to register the baby who resulted from it. And they prevented to issue the birth certificates. Uh, in Egypt, we have a case, uh, we face this problem. Although the Egyptian uh, laws uh, uh, has a, sp a specific provision to register the illegitimate child, as the law mentioned, is uh, called them uh, legitimate child. We have a law, but it's not uh, implemented in a good manner. Uh, so this is one of important. And also, this problem is linked to what they uh, speak about is the statelessness. Because if the children or the migrant mother and, or regime mother uh, fail to, to register her baby who resulted from rape, uh, this person, these children will be face the, st the situation of statelessness. And the problem being more, uh, the situation being more difficult if the, the victim is subject to rape in the root, not in Egypt. For example, uh, to clarify this point that in Egypt, to, the foreigner has a right to, uh, to register the baby, but this provided that the baby, the, the mother delivered the baby in, in Egypt, not out of Egypt. So if, for example, if some refugees or migrants come from, uh, from like Sudan or Ethiopia or Eritrea and they subject to rape in the route and she delivers the baby in Egypt. So in this time, she don't has a right to register the baby with Egyptian asserts and uh, issue the birth certificate. And this, of course, puts them uh, at risk to be a statelessness person. Uh, to, uh, to not to waste your time that I, I published some I want to one article about this topic and I can share in the chat box for more details. And thank you for this opportunity. So. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, let me see, Hani Shahar, Hani, are you here? We would really love to hear your take on this if you're here. Okay, I think, I think we are having a an issue with, with reaching Hani, but um, maybe maybe next time. Okay, so I think we are kind of 10 minutes um, before it's time to conclude the webinar. I'll just go back to to the panel for kind of final, final reflection and the final uh, conclusions and thoughts on what we've heard during the discussion. Let me start with you, Pia. Uh, yeah, hi, hi, Hula, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Okay, good. Um, no, I just wanted to maybe just the last thing to to finish on, and thank you again for a really interesting um, um, webinar. And 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 I thought it was really interesting how you covered so many different issues as well. And I think this is really, I guess, what you're learning through this journey through the twenty three objectives is that you will constantly be speaking about the other objectives as you're going on. And obviously, this is that three hundred sixty degree vision of of migration 
which is interlinked. So, you know, objective four, I was thinking actually while, while uh, people were speaking and actually while I was thinking about what to say, that there is such a great link between objective 15 um, on services and, and this objective. And actually when Michelle was, was talking about educating uh, the negotiators, you will all recall that there was a very live discussion about decriminalization when we were talking about objective 15. And I think that that applies very much to the discussion that we're having here, because um, if you decriminalize um, irregular entry and stay, you're in a situation where the, the stakes of being documented or not are lowered. So you're not in such a life or death, literally life or death situation um, for being undocumented. Um, and I think that that again is, is, you know, it was not a step that the member states that were negotiating wanted to go as far as um, uh, as the co-facilitators wanted to really kind of have a, a, a recommendation to decriminalize irregular migration. But uh, certainly there is a, a, a soft reference to it in, in objective 15. And I think linking that to objective four will be um, important uh, going forward. But I'll stop there and thank you very much again for the invite. Um, it's been a pleasure to join you today. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Pia. Um, I realize that Amish, Amish has been having a technical difficulty unmuting, but I think now it's, it's working. Let's go to Amish for this final comment, and then we go back to the rest of the panel for conclusions. Amish? Uh, thank you, Rula. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Perfect. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity and also to say that like, you know, looking at the documentation on documentation aspect of things, having um, a rights-based approach to this is, is a solution I see uh, that should work for everywhere and for everyone. Uh, something that Pia initially in an intervention mentioned also like, you know, it is there in, uh, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as well as in other treaties as well. Um, it's just that, it's about how governments implement these in their national legislations. You know, having documentation, having identity is fundamental human rights for all, irrespective of how they have arrived in the country. So I think, again, you know, picking up from something that Michelle said before, like, you know, some of the issues that we could look at is um, informing undocumented workers about their rights, you know, um, unionizing undocumented workers, you know, some of these things needs to be taken up in a very much rights-based approach. And I think governments need to be upbeat about this. I'll end my intervention there, Rula. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Amish, good points there. Uh, Michelle, we go to you. Thanks, Rula, for your great chairing and for all of the active participation, both in the chat box and also in this last kind of short tour de table at the end. Um, I personally, whenever I come uh, to your region, your very broad region, because I know you're covering kind of two regions, I always learn so much. And I think the starkness of the situation, I think, uh, I mean, Ellen's example of the right to identity, even in death, um, I don't know how starker you can get uh, that the, the actual body of someone can't even be properly repatriated because of documentation issues. Um, I mean, some of these things, I think uh, we just see them much more, um, uh, yeah, in a more severe note in different regions. And so I think we need to lift up these examples um, because uh, also when um, the colleague uh, was talking about, um, I think Mohammed was talking about children who have been born of rape, but the, the mother can't register the baby. We've had cases like that also in the European region. Um, and they have been able to register them, but then also the mother would also be remaining undocumented. Um, and there was actually a case that we worked on a number of years ago. One of our members did of a, a father who was a diplomat and the mother was a domestic worker who was raped. And so, I mean, there's so then we see also these cases then that repeat themselves in different regions and what can be strategies in, in between regions uh, to exchange uh, when the cases are very similar. I think that's really important. Um, Regimon's example of um, all of these workers who were deported and then had to be paying fines. I've seen now the fourth appeal, the access to justice appeal. I think it's excellent that um, 
your organizations are really calling up this issue of undocumented workers who are being deported without being paid. Um, so, I mean, these are all issues that relate to other objectives rather than kind of the objective itself of objective four. Um, but with GCM, with the Global Compact on Migration, the co-chairs were always saying it's a 360 degree view of migration. So we have to look at it. They all, in a sense, relate to each other. Um, but I would just end by saying, I think uh, we as advocates um, need to continue to collect, excuse me, examples of how the situation is on the ground concerning undocumented. So we, we, this is what we kind of do at PECOM for our region, but then we're also very interested to know in other regions what are entitlements that undocumented might have for healthcare. Um, when we were doing the input in the Global Compact, um, the first phase, I think when, when it was kind of stock taking or no, that was the second phase, it was the one before then when they were doing all these information sessions. And we were trying to say how many countries in the world enable undocumented migrants by law to have access to healthcare we in a sense can't really draw on too many examples beyond Europe because we don't have as many. So that's just one practical example, but this is something that we could further collectively build our knowledge upon. Uh, because once we know what the law says, then we can also understand where the law deviates in the practice. Um, in how many countries can a child be registered if the child is illegitimate and the mother is undocumented? We don't really know that even in our region. Um, that's not something that we've actually noted, but these are the things that I think we as civil society need to, to understand and then also work with the other actors. So the lawyers, um, especially to try to get the jurisprudence, um, but then the other professional bodies. That's where we've actually seen a lot of the um, a lot of the good practices come about is the health professionals, the education professionals, um, and the city level officials. Uh, just to give some examples, but um, I think it's been great to be on the call. Thank you very much for all these uh, examples and inspiration, um, and look forward definitely to hearing how this next phase of objectives and webinars will be uh, developing. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Lala had actually had to leave uh, for an emergency. So I'll just go to Gopal next. Um, thank you, Rola, again. Um, I know the time is running out, but uh, I, I do really appreciate uh, all these questions and observations on the chat box, which we have not been able to address categorically now, but they're all well noted uh, for our future discourse, of course. Uh, at the end, I would just like to, uh, you know, reiterate that we there is no acute shortage of, you know, conventions and you know normative frameworks. We have a refugee convention, we have migration convention, we have Palermo protocol, uh, and then we have so many other processes like Bali, Abu Dhabi, Colombo, and many many processes in place. The the key question is again, as our previous speakers have already you know uh, highlighted, uh, that. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, there is no uh, strong political will on the part of the you know, political leadership, actually, and the government. And secondly, what I have realized uh, during my you know, work in the region, uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the, the conventions, the conventions as well as the you know the New York Declaration, the GCM, GCR provisions, they have not been or they are highly known at grassroots level. You talk to an immigration person, you talk to the police or any other authorities or even judges in the court, there is no sensitization. You know there is no sensitization at the grassroots level, and so I think that is where we need to work. That is where I think the whole issue needs to be. You know, you know, proliferated or amplified because we are people on the front line, like in the reception center, like in the immigration, you know, port authorities, they have no clue about the provisions of the New York Declaration or GCM, GCR, and other uh, conventions. Because uh, the, the whole New York Declaration and uh, Global Compact for Migration and Refugees have. Uh, very clearly outline the whole issue of you know documentation on five primarily on five different you know uh, provisions 
because the first one, I just like to say, uh, no, no, mention about the first one. It says protection of human rights of all refugees and migrants, regardless of status, including rights of women, girls, are promoting full, equal, meaningful participation in finding solution. For example, so accordingly, it talks uh, like the 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 documents all talk about the proof of legal identity, early and effective registration and documentation of migrants, adoption of you know, effective measures to facilitate the access to civil registration, and of course, you know, also uh, identification for travel documents and part of the durable solution, especially for refugees. You know. So the last thing I would like to mention about, uh, I think it is also the, uh, the accountability on the part of the uh, country of origin as well, when the countries you know, enter into any kind of bilateral or trilateral you know, memorandum of understanding or agreement with regards to particularly on labor, I think they should play very smart. They should be very smart. That, uh, so like keeping all these things into consideration, the, any MOUs uh, you know, should be concluded. And, and, that, and categorically, the uh, uh, categorically, the provisions should be should be included that the undocumented migrants will not be persecuted in the absence of documents. You know, so uh, so so I think the it's not only a question of the country of destination, but also country of origin has also equal uh, accountability and responsibility to protect the rights of the you know population on the more. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gopal Kandai. So I recognize time is in the negative. So I'll just finish with the thought that maybe we should challenge the logic of the framing of documents like the GCM. And I would suggest that it is not a problem that people move and the people that move aren't a problem. And it's not a problem, the people who are living without citizenship. Perhaps the problem is citizenship and those who are documented and regular. And perhaps uh, I, as someone who has a comfortable citizenship needs to see myself as that problem and to understand what that means for others. That's what I'll leave it with. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Tandai, and thanks a lot to all our panelists. I think it's, uh, it's been a sobering discussion in the sense of seeing how many layers there are when we talk about documentations and, and gradually getting to, to the whole issue of, of how, how by trying to facilitate sometimes documentation, we end up maybe causing even more harm and even more problems. Um, I think what Gopal said at the at the very end of this, um, you know, with regards so to, to, to people not even being aware of what kind of standards and commitments there are, and it being all that matters at the end, it's that immigration officer, it's that person who's in the contact with migrants and how how they interpret what should be done and what is needed and what kind of documents or not documents are needed there. I think this is essential. So how can we build from, from the grassroots up as opposed to looking at what kind of you know, global commitments exists out there and how they can be translated? How can we build a, an understanding of what is needed? Um, again, as Gopal said at some point, uh, from a needs-based approach, not, not the other way around. I think also kind of Tendai's final, final points are really to, to make us question about you know, what, what's, what's at the, the roots of all of this? Why do we need documentation? And why is it getting more and more complex as we go in time in, in requiring more and more documents going forward? What was very simple, what were porous borders in the past now are, are you know, are, are talked about in a, in, a very, in a very negative light. We, we have a porous border that we need to manage. We need to issue people with documents. And we see this happening across the globe in different examples, you know borders being you know managed and governed and documentation is also an aspect of this i thank thank everyone for their wonderful contributions thank you for the participants and apologies if i missed a question or a comment out there um thanks for the thanks for the grfdt team for mfa for the action committee please stay tuned with us uh for next week's uh, webinar which is again on a very interesting subject of of pathways objective five of the pcm uh, I wish you all a nice evening, morning, wherever you are. Thanks a lot and good night. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.